you know, like I said, I think mentally now I'm in, I'm in such a good place where I have a whole new perspective on not just football, but on life, you know, a sense of gratitude where I'm just happy to, I'm happy to be here, man. I'm happy to be breathing. What's going on, guys? This is Chris Wyman. I appreciate you guys checking out my channel and the latest episode of my podcast, Won't Back Down. I have a great show planned for today, but before we begin, I want to tell you about my show's presenting sponsor, BioAccelerator. BioAccelerator is the world leader in stem cell therapy and regenerative medical research. Through the use of their powerful golden stem cells, they help patients heal from joint and orthopedic injuries, autoimmune disorders, spine and disc damage, and neurological trauma. I went down to Medellin, in Colombia, and I got my stem cells, and honestly, I feel great. My leg is improving every single day, and it takes about six months to get full effect from the stem cells, and I'm really excited to see uh, what happens in the future. Uh, thanks again to BioAccelerator for helping sponsor this show and create my show, Won't Back Down, which is also available on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. We got Christian McCaffrey on the Won't Back Down show, one of the greatest running backs of all time in NCAA history, one of the greatest uh, just players uh, right now in the NFL, going through uh, you know an injury right now, which I can understand, and uh, I know it's super frustrating. Um, first, how you feeling, man? Oh, I feel good, man. Uh, I feel good. Appreciate you having me on. Obviously, a uh, big fan uh, of yours, so it means a lot for you know for you to have me on. But um, oh, I appreciate. Yeah, no, so. I mean, I, I feel good. You know, I mean, it's it's you know, as you know, the injury process uh, can be a lot. You know, sometimes more mentally and emotionally than anything. So, um, yeah, but but I'm doing good. I've I've found kind of a good flow of. Um, you know, putting everything into perspective and looking at the bigger picture and uh, learned a lot of, along the way. So I'm in a good spot. From everybody I spoke to, which Dr. Merkel, who knows you real well, who does physical therapy with you, uh, Jack Eichel. And I talked to, I talked to Chris, uh, Chris Camozzi out of Denver. Oh yeah. You know, you know Camozzi, right? Yeah. 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 Um, I guess he was asking your boy Grant, is that one of your best friends from out there? Yeah. So we're, we're doing homework. I'm all in on you. I got everything. Yeah. Um, but what everybody kind of says about you is that, well, one, you're a freak, but two, you're maniacal about your body and like doing the right thing uh, to keep yourself at high performance and uh, just doing, doing everything you can uh, uh, to control the things uh, that you can to keep your body in, in the right spot. Um, and uh, I have some as a professional athlete. Oh, and you kind of remind me of like, if I had to draw a parallel between you and uh, someone from the UFC, you remind me of like a George St. Pierre. George St. Pierre is one of these guys that the pro athletes kind of look up to when it comes to different training techniques and different physical therapy technique techniques, because he really is not afraid to spend the money and to, to do the research and to surround themselves with really good people uh, to prepare himself uh, and, you know, to be in the best spot he possibly could be in. So I'm going to go through a whole bunch of physical therapy techniques. And, and, and this is really for all those, all the pro athletes out there. They want to hear and, and all people, just athletes in general on what you actually think is crap when it comes to physical therapy techniques and what actually works, because I'm super skeptical throughout the years of, you know, being, you know, on the physical therapy tables of what really works. It doesn't work. And I'm curious on what your takes on these would be. Um, all right. Let, Ultra let, me, let me start. Let me start out by. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll no, no, go ahead. What do you guys, you, you want ahead. You, you're rebuttaling me. Well, I'm just, one thing. It's so funny that you asked that because, um, you know, I, I have my opinions right on, on what I like best and, uh, what I think works and what I think is crap. But, um, what I've learned along the way is it's so individual, you know, and I think, from from a personal training standpoint to a physical thera therapy standpoint to uh, you know what kind of treatment you're doing, what kind of recovery you're doing, <clears throat> like I, I've changed so much in my five years in the league on what I do and what I don't do, uh, just because I've grown as an athlete. You know, I have more wear and tear on my body now. I've gone through some injuries. I stay away from some stuff. I've added some stuff. Um, 
I do some stuff now that four years ago I thought was crap. You know what I mean? I yeah. think that's the beauty of, uh, going through this whole process is what I say now could change in two years. You know what I mean? And partly, you know, because how much medicine and how much training has evolved throughout the years. Um, you know, I'm always struggling with the balance of, you know, what, what do you do? Do you do too much now? Do you, do you, you, you kind of grind it out now or do you back off? What's the, what's the correct threshold to put yourself in a, in a position to succeed? So, you know, I have my opinions, um, you know, and I've obviously struggled with some injuries, but, you know, one thing I stopped doing was uh, relating my injuries to any kind of training or treatment I do. Cause you know, football, I'd say, you know, obviously it goes UFC and then all other sports below that. But when it comes to injuries, they're inevitable, you know? Yeah. And, and they, they happen. So the same way I don't always attribute my success to my training. I don't always attribute my injuries or failures to my training and start to try to reinvent the wheel. So I always go, when it comes to training and and treatment, I always go off of you know, how did I feel? Like, how did, if I didn't feel good going into a game and I was like, man, I feel slow. I feel, you know, a little bit of, you know, lackadaisical or then, you know, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll have to readjust, but I stopped, you know, looking at the result and, and changing my process. You know what I mean? Because I've had a lot of success doing it the way I do it. And I, and, you know, obviously I've been hurt doing it the way I do it, but, um, you know, like, like you, you know, I, I've, read up on you obviously too. And, and being a fan from afar, everyone kind of says, says the same thing, you know, elite worker, hardest worker in the gym. You know, I heard kind of talked a little bit before, but heard your coach talk about your work ethic and um, you know, no one was going to outwork you and you've had to adjust a little bit over the years. Well, you know, it's, it's the same in football. It's the same in other sports. You just continuously adjust and, and learn and grow. But um, you know, that's a long explanation of to the point it's, it can be very individual. And, and, and then I think there's also an aspect <laughs> of, you know, how, <laughs> if you believe something's going to work, it might work, you know what I mean? And oh, good old placebo like, effect. There you go. And, and yeah. you know, there's guys that train complete opposite of me who have a lot of success in the league and then, you know, vice versa. So yeah. it, it's such a journey and a battle with, you know, that mindset and that, you know, the, the confidence side of am I, am I doing the right thing? That's well said. And now, no matter what you say, you're not going to piss anybody off. Hey. This is this is great. This is like media training 101 right here. Christian McCaffrey just taught everybody out there. Listen, this is how you. I can put my you, script away now. I'll put the script. I, away. I, <laughs> no, that was that was actually great, and it's it, it's just frustrating for an athlete because if you really are maniacal about keeping your body in the right spot, there's so many different things you could do, and you only have so much time in the day. And you have to kind of prioritize what you actually do believe is helping you and what's not. And it is very frustrating and hard. And, and anytime athletes could talk and kind of like help each other out and figure out what they're doing and it might be helping them, uh, you know, it's always a positive for everybody. But here we go. Let's play this little game. First time I've ever done this with anybody. Let's see how it goes. Um, so it's either crap or it's good. And then I'll, I'll stop you if I have any questions on any of them. But ultrasound. As a as a therapy or as a diagnostic instrument? No, therapy. I, there's better tools out there. All right. He says crap. crap. I just say there's better. There's better. <laughs> ice, ice baths. Depends. Uh, depends on how you use them, in my opinion. I'm, I'm a heat guy. I don't, I don't ice a whole lot, but I think there's a time and a place for it. Who do you, so I, I, I've changed over the years with ice bath. Ice bath has always been my favorite thing, but based on some new people that I listened to some different doctors that I spoke to um, I'm with you I'm a big heat guy as well, but the ice baths um, based on when you do it and how you do it, I think has a big part of it. What, what, when do you like ice baths? Is there a time? Or oh, is- no, I, I actually would do it. Um, I like contrast on an off day. I don't ever, I don't like ice tubbing unless, you know, if there's an acute injury that has inflammation, you know, you can ice just to try to get that initial swelling down. Um, I like doing like a cold plunge maybe in the morning when I wake up just to start my day in the off season or um, I'll go from the sauna to a cold plunge to the sauna and kind of contrast that way or a hot tub. I, I like the sauna a lot. Um, but I think the ice tub for me, I, I've really looked at it now instead of a tool for you know muscle recovery, more as like a, 
um, a nervous system tool to, to really get your adrenaline going and wake you up a little bit. Um, there's a bunch of different benefits for it um, from just an overall neural output, you know, kind of studies, you know, I, I think, you know, you probably know all the Wim Hof stuff and different things like that. It's not necessarily for muscle recovery, more for just a general um, energy level and, and hormonal response that you get from it. Um, Agree. And the hormonal, I, go yeah. ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no I, I like heat because, you know, you think about the ice tub, when you ice tub for, you know, five, eight minutes, 10 minutes, whatever it is, you're pretty much done for the day. And there's a reason for it. You know, you're kind of freezing the tissue and, and the muscles. And as a football player, I, I just like being loose, um, you know, being able to run and feeling like, you know, everything is, is oiled up, so to say, rather than stiff. All right. I like it. Um, uh, I'm with you. I like the hormonal response um, more from the saunas than the ice baths, but you do get that hormonal response from the ice bath as well, apparently based on the studies. Um, so uh, stim, just stim unit. I think there's, there's better tools. All right. He says crap. crap. Mas uh, massage. Love massage. Yeah. Is it multiple times a week? Or yeah, I mean, I'll do it. Uh, you know, I like getting a good flush massage, like right after the game. I'm talking in season, probably do it right after the game and then do it on like a, you know, a Thursday, maybe. I don't like doing it too close to, um, to competition or too close to like a very fast training session. Um, more of a relaxer, like I, you know, flush, flush the tissue out, you know, get any kinks out that you got to get. And it's relaxing too, which I think is also just really good for recovery. Now, do you do like, is it more of a relaxing massage to where they're not killing you or you want to be killed the whole time? I don't, I don't really like being killed. I like, I like a somewhere in between, you know, small pressure and, and a lot of pressure. Uh, I like a good flush, but somebody, you know, one thing I've learned too with massage is you have to understand, you know, the, the direction of the tissue, you know what I mean? Like that, you know, your tissue moves in certain angles and directions and, you know, your hamstring and your quad, they all have different fibers and mu the muscles go a certain way. And I, I've learned the best masseuses really understand the anatomy and are able to, you know, um, they're able to massage the, the muscles and, and the tissue in those directions instead of just, you know, digging an elbow into you and yeah, dig a knot out. I, I, I always found that sometimes it feels good, but I, I, you know, the next day it's, I don't really feel any better when that happens. So, yeah, I'm not into that, the super hard massage where I'm in pain the whole time either. It, it, I don't feel like the benefit outweighs what's going on, <laughs> the pain. Um, where were we? Uh, adjustments. Yes. I'm a, I'm a fan. Me yeah. too. Dry needling. Yep. Fan. Me too. Hyperbaric chambers. Great. Do you do them at all? Yeah. Yeah. I, I have my own. I actually bought my own. Um, when I, uh, when I got, I hurt my ankle last year and I got my own and I would, I would sit in there for three hours a day, you know, read a book or watch a movie or something. I, I'm a huge fan of those. And you, it, like how much pressure, what's like the PSI that you go down? I don't know the exact level of pressure. I know the best ones are the hard shell ones that, you know, you go into a hospital. Yeah. Those are the, like the burn victims go into those ones. They got the oxygen. Right. Um, yeah. I'm sure I mean, you probably lived in those. Yeah. Yeah, I spent a lot of time in it, but um, I didn't see results. So I, I considered buying it for my house just because when I was doing it in New York, it was kind of a pain in the ass to get to. And I was hitting traffic and I'm like, all right, I'm spending an hour and a half in this machine, uh, you know, an hour in traffic. I'm like, man, this is a lot of my out of my day and you're supposed to do it, you know, pretty frequently. And I'm not sure if it really is working. This yeah. is this is a few years ago, but now there there are more studies and and things that have now proven that it does actually show results. Um, yeah. So I do want to get back. I do want to start getting into hyperbaric chambers again. I think you're right, though. I I you know I think the pressure matters. You know, if you don't have one that gets to a high enough pressure, I I wouldn't. I'd say it's not worth it. But I had a uh, Diamond Dallas Page. You know the wrestler, uh, yeah. WWE wrestler. I had him on, and he's a huge hyperbaric chamber guy. Um, and he has one in his house too. And no, he, he, man, he, he blew me away with like all the information that he had on it. And he swears by the one that he has at, at the house too. And he, and he, I forgot exactly what he was telling me, but um, it made me start considering getting one. Interesting. Yeah. yeah you know what I realized when I'm in there, I, I don't want I don't know all the science. I'm not as familiar with the hyperbaric. I do it a lot, uh, especially when I, you know, when I was hurt, but uh, 
I would get in there and like 45 minutes in, I would like go to crack my back and it was really easy to like crack my back. I just felt like everything was easy to, to move around almost like lighter in a way. It was just like loosening you up. You feel like, yeah. gotcha. All right. Uh, kinesiology tape. I'm going to speed this up. I got too many more. Yeah. It depends. I'd say it depends. Depends. Uh, stem cells. Fan. Fan. Yeah. Me too. Shout out to bio accelerator sponsor of the show. Down go. in Colombia, Medellin, in Colombia. They're awesome. Uh, PRP? Uh, depends on who does it and and the machines used. But yes, I'm a huge fan. ART? Yes. Active yeah, release I'm therapy? A I'm a fan. I love that you know all these too. Um, <laughs> cold laser? Yeah, fan. Theragun or any of those hypervolts? I'm a hyper ice guy. Yeah, hyper- I, I love those things. Hyper- oh, oh. Yeah. Okay. That was a lot. Yeah, me too. Uh, vibration therapy. You ever done that? No. I never you know those things that you stand on? It's like the plate oh, yeah, that yeah, vibrates. Yeah. Uh, um, plate, the, yeah. The yeah. Plate or with the, yeah. You stand uh, on the thing, the whole thing's vibrating. It's supposed to like, I would say, I, up. yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I don't like, I don't do that, but I, I so I, it's hard for me to say. I'm not like, all right. Uh, cupping. I'm not a big fan of cupping. Unless you really know what you're doing. Yeah. yeah. All right. <clears throat> so we talked about all these different physical therapy techniques. I know you take this stuff super serious. Um, and now you're dealing with an injury. Like mentally with, with this going on, like how, how have you been handling this? Knowing that, you know, you wake up in the morning to the second you go to sleep, you know, you're focused on not getting injured and trying to do everything right. And then you get injured because, you know, it's inevitable. How, how, how do you, how have you been dealing with it mentally from the beginning of the injury till now? Yeah. So this last two year stretch has been really hard for me because, you know, I had, I had never missed a game in my life. And then I went from that to, I hurt my ankle week two. And then the game I came back hurt my shoulder, which pretty much knocked me out for the year. So I only played in three games. And then this year, you know, the whole off season I spent, you know, living in my head about, you know, what I have to do to come back better than ever, you know, prove everyone wrong, prove myself, all this stuff. Right. And, um, I came back, you know, we start out three, and zero, but that third game, uh, we play Houston on a Thursday night game and Jack, my hamstring up. So that knocked me out for some time, come back playing a few games and then ankle just got rolled up on bad by like three linemen and, uh, knock me out for the year. So the exhausting part is the reoccurring part. You know, you do so much, you're, you're up at early in the morning and, and your whole day is revolved around getting better. And you have to watch your teammates play. You know, you got to sit there wondering, you know, there, it's inevitable, right? You're, I'm, I'm human. So you start to feel like, can I, can I still do this? Like, am I, you know, why is this happening to me and questioning yourself? And um, it was really hard at first. And and I'll be honest with you, you know, I got to the point where I was like, I'm not going to make it if I keep, you know, living in my head like this and, and making this such a big deal. And so I just started truly like trying to live in, in, in each moment and just chopping wood and, and trusting God. And that was it. And I was like, you know what? there's a reason for everything. There's a plan behind this and I'll win in the end. And that's what I kept telling myself is, you know, really putting everything into perspective and looking at the bigger picture. Cause you know, you can, you can get into some dark times. I'm sure you know this uh, when you're hurt mentally, that's it's almost worse than the physical injury. And I think that's the side of just athletics in general that people don't understand. You know, you put your life into, I put my life into this, man. you know, I really do. And uh, whether I'm, I do everything right or whether some things are right or some things are wrong, I really do put my life into this. You know, I've, uh, I've had to, you know, push my family aside, pushed all my loved ones aside to focus on my career selfishly and training and treatment and, you know, canceling things so that I can do in, you know, I, I love every second of it, but, but when, when you do all that and it still doesn't work, it can be really hard. But, you know, like I said, I think mentally now I'm in, I'm in such a good place where I have a whole new perspective on not just football, but on life, you know, a sense of gratitude where I'm just happy to, I'm happy to be here, man. I'm happy to be breathing. 
Um, and, and so that's helped a lot. It's, it's been help. You know, I think the other thing too, you figure out, you figure out who's got your back and who doesn't. And that's yeah. been something that, you know, has been huge for me because, you know, you can't go through this stuff alone. You know, that's, nope. that's, that's brutal if you try to do that. So having a good support cast who believes in you, you know, and helps you believe in yourself and, uh, is there for you and jokes around it to you and like, you know, humor has been the best cure for me, you know, just cracking jokes and being able to smile. Like that's a big yeah. ass. And I know people don't really see that all the time, but that's, you know, that's, that's part of it. You know, you learn to appreciate just being happy at, you know, at moments of the day because it gets, it gets tough, but it's part of the game. You know, it happens to, it happens to everybody, you know, and, and that's, that's the thing too. It's not all about me. Mm. I, that was something I had to let go of too, that this isn't all about me. This is, this is about everybody. This, we're, you know, we play a team sport and, um, just take it one day at a time and enjoy it. Amen, bro. That's, that was great. Um, it's, it's one of the things I always say about it being injured and I've been being, I've been injured more than probably most, which sucks. Uh, like, you know, you have a certain potential and like as athletes, you know, your potential and you want to be able to show the world and, and, and prove that to everybody. And when injuries happen, it's just so deflating. It's like, you gotta be freaking kidding me. But at the end of the day, it happened. You can't change it, right? So you gotta you gotta just shift your mind into positivity and find like silver linings. Like when right. when you are injured, there's more time on your hands, right? You're not like, you know, uh, you know, for me, you know, training for a fight or you know, whatever, dealing with media. It's more chill and there's more time to kind of reflect on the things that maybe you weren't doing great in your life that you want to correct and make better, you know, whether it's you know, mental health or you know, spiritually um different routines and habits that you want to like be better at like dealing with laziness that you know you've been trying to fix for years but you just life hasn't slowed down enough to for you to actually make those corrections um so there's so much opportunity in in injury where it does give you a chance to come back better than before it's true like when you know when people say they could come back better than before you really do have an opportunity to do that if you if you make the most of it Right. You feel that? A hundred percent. I think <clears throat> to your point, you know, when it's new and you've never experienced it, that's when the chaos starts in your head because you don't, you don't know how to handle it. But I can honestly say I'm so much more proud of the person I am now than the person I was when, when I, you know, when I was having great years and balling, I'm so much more proud of who I am now. I've gotten, like you said, the, the word opportunity, you know, it, it's your blessing, you know, to have to be able to go through something that like that and, and continue to struggle like that's that's what's going to make the story that much cooler. And that's what's going to make it so much more amazing that, you know, you, you go through things and push through it and, and you're learning. There is no losing. You know, you're, you're continuing to learn and and grow in these experiences. And, you know, I, I just it's just your ammo. You know what I mean? And you continue to stack clips and all the things that you've been through, that's just ammo for, for when, you know, you're going to win one day. And honestly, whether it, whether it's in football or life, it's just, you're, you're able to, you know, I heard a good quote. It's, it's peace isn't peace isn't uh, finding joy when everything's good. It's being able to uh, have love and peace in your heart when there's chaos around you. I butchered the quote, but it's, you get the point. I get it. Yeah. And, and, and to me, it's so true. It's, it's, you're able now to experience life with a certain edge about you in a peaceful way though, you know what I mean? And being okay and seeing the bigger picture and understanding that uh, everything you go through is a lesson, you know what I mean? In, in the grand scheme of life, cause you know, we play, we play a sport and obviously you guys, your sport is much more, in my opinion, um, <laughs> it's a depends. Different. You guys do, who you talk to. You guys do it different. That's a different yeah. game. I don't know if I would even call it a game. That's a whole level, but just the mindset in general, it's in the grand scheme of life. You know, I think football is also about relationships. It's about the guys you meet, you know, I mean, and obviously you're in an individual sport, but you have fight teams, you know, you got sparring partners that you got to go through hell with all the time. Um, and, and your team matters and your team needs you, you know, whether you're playing or not. And so that's been something for me that's been, that's been good is, is not, not holding in, you know, every, all of my knowledge, you know, being able to be there for younger guys and, and share your knowledge and continue to, to, you know, be a presence in the locker room 
it's not only helped me, but you know, it's helped some of those other guys too. And it's been really good for me just to stay in the game, but um, you know, having confidence in myself has been a big thing too. Like, you know, I'm, I'm injuries happen, you know, I'm, I'm 25 years old. I still have, you know, not had to have a whole lot of surgeries, which is good. I've only had to have one and that was an irrelevant one that was after my rookie year. So, you know, the way I see it, I'm still healthy, young and ready to roll. You know what I mean? And I think that's important just to know that in my head that, you know, I still have a lot of ball left. I'm in this for the long haul and I'm in this for the marathon, you know, not, not the 60 meter sprint. A hundred percent. Um, Basically, you know, staying, staying uh, grateful in struggle, right? Like right. you should be grateful. Everyone's going to have struggle on, uh, you know, no matter what they're doing in life and to be able to have the wherewithal to understand that this is just like, you know, moment in time and to be grateful of your situation and try to become better from it is an awesome place to be. I'm going to read this to you right now. <clears throat> your family lineage because it's freaking crazy. Uh, McCaffrey's father, Ed McCaffrey, played in the co played college football at Stanford and, and in the NFL, mostly for the Denver Broncos from 90, 1991 to 2003. He's a big fan of his. His mother, Lisa, is it Sim or Sim A? Or how do you pronounce mother's maiden name? Sim. Sim. Uh, Lisa Sim played soccer at Stanford University. His older brother, Max, played football at Duke University and then on several teams as a wide receiver. His younger brother, Dylan, is a quarterback at Northern Colorado. His youngest brother, Luke, is a quarterback at Rice University. His uncle, Billy McCaffrey, played college basketball at Duke and Vanderbilt University. His maternal grandfather is David Sim at, at, and was an Olympic track star. Did I get that all right? Am I missing anybody? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm sure there's a couple more out there, but you pretty much got the gist of it, you know. Bro, what is what is that like? That is that's pretty crazy. You can't yeah. say you don't, you can't say you're not a genetic freak. With well, I'm thankful for my genes, that's for sure. Uh, <laughs> I'm definitely thankful for my genes. Um, it's a competitive household, I'll tell you that much. You know, three brothers and uh, growing up, and obviously, my, my pops playing football and my mom being an athlete, it was always doing something, you know, always finding something to compete in. But, um, yeah, I'm super thankful, you know, all, all the knowledge that I was able to learn from, from my dad and from my older brother. And, um, you know, we, we, we used to, uh, have a good little four on four football games and, and, and we compete with other guys around the neighborhood. And we pretty much filled the, filled the whole entire, you know, we could, we could technically make half of a seven on seven team. You know, both my brothers are quarterbacks, but my youngest brother, he was kind of, he could play receiver and running back and do everything. He's a hell of an athlete. And then my older brother played receiver and I played running back. So, you know, we would be training in, in the off season and we, we could almost fill the field. So made it fun growing up, you know, being able to throw with those guys and run routes and learn from my brother and um, learn from my dad and uh, compete with each other. You know, a lot of the times we were on the same teams too, which was a lot of fun. You know, I got to play with my older brother and, my younger brother in high school, uh, which, you know, I, I, I really was thankful for. So, um, yeah, sports have been, a, you know, pretty much the ace in our family since, since I can remember. I like being in a family like that was, was your dad, like how, how did your dad parent you and like coach you as a kid coming up? Like, you know, I got kids now and everyone's always trying to figure out like what the best way, if you have an athletic kid or you have, uh, you know, um, someone who is passionate about athletics, what's the right way to direct them? And at what age do you start? And if you're pushing or pulling, what, what's your, uh, what, what, what was it like for you first? And then I'll ask you yeah, what you think. Question. I don't even know if there's a right answer. I think everybody's kind of figuring out, um, you know, as, as you go, but I think it's different for everybody. Um, you know, my dad, my dad actually never coached me. Um, but, I think it was important to him and my mom that whatever we did, we just did it a hundred percent. You know, they never made us play sports. I was, I saw my brother play sports and uh, I just wanted to be like him. You know, I saw him in football pads and he was eight and I was six and I, I was just itching to, to put the pads on. And, you know, I think, I don't think my parents had a choice and I was going to throw a fit if I wasn't able to play. So I started at seven and so did my younger brothers and my older brother, I think started at eight, but, it was really because we wanted to, you know, and 
Um, I played basketball, I played baseball, I ran track, you know, they, they were, they were big on doing multiple sports. And I think nowadays kids stick to one and, uh, I've never been a fan of that. I think it's important to be a kid and get away from the game and, and go do other stuff. Um, but you know, he, he, he wasn't, he wasn't all in my face with coaching points all the time. You know, if he saw something, he would say it, um, but I think it was more important to him that we just did it the right way, you know, that we were good teammates, that we were humble in victory and um, humble in defeat and, and just understood the importance of, you know, what it means just to be a good teammate, to, to have a, you know, a good character, to have a good impact on guys and, um, you know, what it means to be a leader, to be a follower and uh, go through all the different things that you go through in like peewee sports and high school sports, you know, and so he never coached me. He coached my other brothers in different areas and different teams. Um, but, you know, I think they, they did an, uh, an awesome job of letting us be ourselves because, you know, there was definitely pressure growing up being his son and in the Denver area, you know, the McCaffrey name was already a you know, pretty big name. So, um, you know, you heard, you heard the birds talk and you heard the different things, but they never made that a big deal. You know, he, he never made it about him, you know, which was awesome. He just shared his knowledge and, and loved us and rooted for us. Just like, you know, we were his son and it felt like that. And so we were very fortunate to have great parents. Awesome. Um, I'm with you on doing multiple sports too. I just, I think it's crazy how everybody's trying to, you know, push kids at an early age to stick to one sport because then you're going to have positive re results with that. And you're going to be able to stick with that sport, but like passion only lasts for so long. And as far as an athlete, I think it'll take away some athleticism that you might have if you're not able to do different cross training with other sports. Mm -hmm. Um, I also think it's a money thing. Every sport wants to make more money from, you know, a kid, you know, and so if you could pull them into lacrosse and that's all they're going to do all year long, you know, you're going to make tons of money. So it makes sense, but uh, I'm not a fan of it either, but you do feel pressure as a parent to do it because everyone, everyone else is doing it. And if your kid's not putting the same amount of time as other kids in that one sport, uh, like your kids may not be as good at that time as some of the kids as they're like, you know, nine, 10 years old. Um, so you feel the pressure, but I, I agree with you. You got to stay strong, keep them and everything. My question is, as far as strength and conditioning goes and like habit building as uh, like, how are your parents with that? Like, you know, are we waking up early and doing strength and conditioning together? Are we doing like pushups and sit ups before dinner? Um, it was there like how many days a week, you know, was focused just on becoming a better athlete? Yeah, it's, you know, I, I actually get asked that a lot. And I, I was always in season, you know, because I played so many sports. I never, I never, you know, up till like, and obviously in high school, you, you know, you, I started to lift weights and, and do all that stuff in high school. I never, I never lifted up until then, up until my freshman year. Um, but I was in football season. And then, you know, I went from football season and oftentimes, you know, you'd, you'd play on Saturdays and then basketball started in the winter. And, you know, you'd, you'd play basketball games on Sundays and, and then it'd feed right into basketball season and I would hoop and, and then it goes right into baseball and then I was doing track meets. So I, I was never, you know, I was just learning as, as an athlete to play different sports. And I think that's like, you know, like you touched on, it's something that's lost nowadays is, you know, guys aren't training athletes anymore. They're training that, you know, specific position or, or sport. Um, so I never did any specific personal training. I would, if we had a few weeks off, I'd get a workout in with, you know, the guys that my dad used to train with and um, some of that stuff. My dad used to, I remember, I, you know, when we would do that, which was rare because we were always in season, my dad would put us through his old workouts. And I just remember dying because his warm, he would do this warm, -up, like a 45 minute dynamic warm up. And I get made fun of nowadays for going out to practice so early and warming up and doing my whole thing. But I learned it from my dad when I was about eight years old. We used to, you know, he would put us through the whole thing. And by the end of the warm up, you're thinking you're done with the workout and it hasn't even started. And I remember he's doing this conditioning with us where we would do like 10 hundreds, eight eighties, six sixties, four forties, uh, two twenties, full speed 10. And then you'd go back, back up the ladder. And <laughs> how, old, how old were you at this point? Well, this was just periodically throughout our childhood, you know, and, and it wasn't often cause we, you know, we were, um, we were always in, in season. He, you know, he wouldn't make us do that if we were, we were in season. Cause you know, we are, our, our coaches, you know, all of my coaches when I was little, 
you know, I had, we, I had a coach named Dwayne Charrington who he was a running back who played for CU. He was my first ever running back coach for, for the Parker Hawks. And we had a baller team, man. We never lost. Shout out to Grant was on that team, Grant Neal. Oh uh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> I, I met Grant when I was seven, so I've known him forever. And, um, but we, you know, we had a, he was in charge of our conditioning and our conditioning was ruthless. You know, we had guys throwing up and, you know, tapping out and crying and, and you know, how it is when, when you're in little league. Yeah. Um, so he never, you know, if he, if he saw we were doing that, he wasn't going to go put it. He wasn't one of those dads that's going to, you know, more, 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 you got to do more. You know, he wasn't yeah. like that. So, um, but when we did, you know, it was just periodically throughout our childhood when we had like, you know, a couple of weeks off and needed to do something, but, um, yeah, that's, that's really how it started. When did you start getting like habitual with, you know, some of the routines that you do now as far as like physical therapy or like whatever strength? What, uh, what are, I'll start, what are, what are the, like some of the routines that and habits that you've built over the years? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I, I think it's, like I said, you know, earlier, it's changed so much. Um, I think I started to understand the importance of it in high school um, just because, my dad was like that, you know, I mean, I, like I said, I'm so fortunate that I got to learn from him, but he was, you know, he had a very strict training regimen for, you know, I, he would eat the same thing every day, you know, and then do all this different crazy stuff. And he was kind of the first one to, you know, he wore kicker pads so he could be lighter and he would cut holes in his cleats so he could just be a little bit lighter and um, <laughs> all these little tricks of the trade just to be faster, you know, and just to get you know, at the end of the day, all this stuff we're talking about, you're, you're fighting for the 0.1% difference. You know, it's not going to win you a game. It's not going to win you a fight, but it's going it, to, you're, you're fighting for minuscule differences that are going to help you have that little advantage over, over the opponent. You know what I mean? And uh, cause everybody at this level is good. Everybody's fast. Everybody's strong. You're, you're fighting for that one thing that's going to make the play at the end of the game. Um, and I guess that was preached really my whole life, you know, <laughs> I tell this story a lot, but my, you know, my, my parents would take our phones at night. You know, I got a phone, we get whatever you get a phone in high school, whatever, you know, you take the phone at night and, um, you know, cause they, they wanted us to sleep. They saw the importance of sleep and, you know, God knows what we'd been, you know, we'd have been doing in high school and yeah. stuff. <laughs> of course. So, you know, they took the phones and I was so blessed. My mom would have, you know, great meals and, uh, kind of understood what it meant to eat healthier. They weren't, they weren't freaks about it. You know, we still were kids and, you know, ate whatever it's at, at points. And if we were hungry, you know, you go down the street to Chick-fil-A, whatever, and grab mm -hmm. a bite. Um, Chick-fil-A is not bad for you though, right? Yeah. It's good. For the whole, <laughs> you know, it's better. Yeah. But uh, you, uh, just, just kind of being fed that my whole life, I, I started to really grow and develop. And I think when I started to, um, you know, in high school, you get a little, you know, a little ding here or there and you start to feel it a little bit, you know, and, so I'd go to the chiropractor that, that my dad used to go to and all the Bronco guys used to go to, uh, he's since passed Nelson Batanzi, rest in peace. But, uh, we'd go to his, we'd go over to his clinic, you know, once or twice a week over in Aurora, Colorado. And I remember I started bringing my teammates and then my teammates would start to go and they would love getting adjusted, you know, twice a week. I didn't even know what it meant back then. You know what I mean? Just getting your neck cracked just felt good. So yeah. <laughs> we'd go over there and, um, you know, we, we would, it was, it, that's kind of when you start. And then in college, you know, now you're getting, you know, you're getting 30 touches, a, 35 touches a game. And, and you're, you know, you can't walk when you wake up the next morning. You're, you're so you, you have to, you don't even have a choice. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So for me, that's when I really started to get into actually researching what is the best for me and started to get into, you know, physical therapy and, and more proactive treatments uh, to prevent all this stuff from happening from, you know, from the warm up to the tissue prep beforehand and all the different things, because you didn't have a choice. Otherwise you were going to be slower. You know, my biggest fear was being slow. I never wanted to be slow and I never wanted to be weak, you know, cause I'd had to hurt, you know, my whole life that I was a smaller scat back who can't run between the tackles. And so for me, I always wanted to be strong or at least look strong. And you know, I <laughs> in high school, you know, the college coaches would come by and, uh, you know, in their recruiting days and I would go do push-ups in the bathroom on the bathroom floor, you know, I'm pumping out push-ups just so when they see me, you know, they get a little look at you're, you know, you're, you're not judged as a smaller back and yeah. doing visits. And my dad would make me put napkins in my shoes. I remember we went to Washington, university of Washington and he's, he would, he gave me this really thick pair of jeans so I would weigh in heavier and I put these small little 10 pound, like ankle weights in my back pocket of the jeans, hoodie jacket over the hoodie, 
and napkins in my shoes. So I was taller. And <laughs> way heavier. I weighed in at like 195 my senior year. I was probably like 180. And, uh, but it, you know, I just kind of had that, you know, some of that stuff said about me. And I, so I, I never wanted to, you know, be weak or, or slow. And so when you're hurt, it's hard to be fast and strong. So I, I just, I think that's, that's really when you realize that there's another level to this is when, when you are hurt, you know, <laughs> when you do feel bad and you're like, I don't feel like me, it's kind of a wake up call. And then, uh, so yeah, that's, that's really when it all started. I, uh, I think the gist of the parenting you got, which I think is great was you, you saw what he did for himself, like how he took care of himself. And over time, when, you know, you start realizing how important it is to be healthy and, and, you know, uh, you know, eating healthy and whatever, just some of the physical therapy stuff, um, you started kind of taking the stuff that you've seen him do as far as his, the way he would be maniacal about right. the process. Right. And then you fed into yours and then you fed it into yourself. It just started becoming who you are. Right. Is that, is that right? That's a, yeah, it's a, it's a great way to put it, you know, and he didn't even always tell us what to do, but I just, I saw the way that he did it and I was okay. I would put it into my own life. Okay. What are these little advantages that I can get here and there? You know, I mean, when, when we were young, he used to get so mad at us if we got Jersey tackled, you know, somebody grabbed us by the Jersey and threw us down. So we go to home Depot and get that double-sided tape. You know, that you stick those little uh, walls together and, and he would tape our pads put our Jersey on and then put it by the fireplace. So it would stick, you know, extra. And, you know, after that, we wouldn't get Jersey tackled. You know, that was the whole, that was the whole goal. So, but it's like, it's little things, you know, and now they got the Velcro to your Jersey and all that stuff, but it's little things that make the big things happen. And I think that was the point. It's like, Hey, you know what you're doing, maybe it's right. Maybe it's not, but Hey, at least I tried, you know what I mean? At least I did. I put every ounce of it into it and tried everything I could to win. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and, and going back to our conversation on injury, that's, that's really where, you know, I can hold my head high. I'm like, you know what? I can honestly look myself in the mirror and say, I did everything I physically and mentally could to, to prepare for that game or to prepare for that season. And, you know, it didn't work out. doesn't mean it's not going to work out again. I, I've always felt great. Every time I go into a football game, I've never felt like, Oh God, I don't feel great. I feel off. I feel slow. So, you know, it's just, you're always on a mission just to, you know the mission changes sometimes yeah. and that's all you could do right like it's like for me going into a fight you want to make sure you do everything you possibly can control uh do everything that you think you're supposed to be doing and if you go out there and you lose all right you lost to a better guy that night and it wasn't meant to be and you could live with it but if you go if you don't prepare properly and you don't do the things you know you're supposed to be doing and you go out there and lose there's tons of you know, reasons why you're going to beat yourself up, you know, right. and it's going to be hard to live with that. You know, and you can have tons of regrets. So yeah, it goes the same way with injuries and yeah. it seems like you got that down pretty good. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, like you said, you know, who's to say I'm not going to, you know, you never know. That's, and that's, you know, you never know. You just, like you said, you just keep putting one foot in front of the other, working as hard as you possibly can. And then, you know, when it comes to Sundays, just go out, man, and let loose. Don't think like I I've never believed and you you can't play, you can't play this sport and think at the same time. You know what I mean? It's got to be you're all in or you're not. There's no in between. There's no half ass in it. It's it's your your full speed green light or your or you can't play. And you know, I've always believed that playing hard is important. You got to play hard. You know what I mean? And sometimes yeah. if you play hard, you get hurt. It's just the way it goes. How was uh how was your family with and your dad and your mom with uh, school? Because obviously you went to Stanford Ivy League, unbelievable school, and your other brother, right? Not, and not necessarily Ivy League. <laughs> is it not considered Ivy League? Not considered Ivy League. All right. Well, super smart kids go to Stanford. <laughs> were they were they on top of you about you know school and high when you were in high school and, and junior high? Was that something that was made uh, as, as a serious priority? Yeah. Yeah, that was um, that was priority number one. You know, our, our whole life growing up uh, was was school. Um, and and honestly, you know, if it if it taught us anything, it was just discipline and that nothing's guaranteed. You know, I, I never I never knew I was going to the NFL until, you know, my, probably my end of my second year in college. I knew that I was going to be on a team, but I didn't know. You know, I didn't know how long I didn't know if I was going to make money or be good. You know, you, you, you don't really know those things. I always believed in myself. But I was naive almost to a point where I didn't, you know, I, I always knew I was going to play well, but you just, I never really thought about the future, you know? And so they always harped on, 
it's really important to have a good education. So if, if something doesn't work out, you can at least, you know, fall back on that. And, um, you know, it was important to me. Uh, I wasn't always the best student. Um, I didn't get into Stanford because of my grades. I can tell you that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but your grades had to be decent to get into yeah, Stanford. They, no, they were, they were about as, if this is the line, they were here good enough to get into Stanford. I, I, <laughs> All I right. they made me take, you know, I had to take the ACT three times because the first two ones weren't up to par. And uh, I remember my senior year, I was all fired up for my senior year and they wanted me to take seven total classes. I was in two APs my senior year, two AP courses. I'm like, this is going to be a terrible senior year, but <laughs> I got it done. You know what I mean? And, and I think it's cool that a school like that can be that hard on their, on their students and, and hold that kind of standard standard and also succeed in football you know um at the time i committed i think there was the year where they had shane scove and trent murphy and all those guys and um i think they were the number number three team in the nation and they were the number one school in the nation and so damn it was really an easy selling point you kind of get the best of both worlds and you know the other thing is i wanted to run in a pro style offense i wanted to be able to run power and run wide zone run inside zone and and not have to worry about being called a scat back. I kind of wanted to check that box for NFL teams. You don't like scat back. You don't like the name. You don't like that. I've learned to love it. You know, I have had, <laughs> had a lot of catches because of it. Yeah, yeah you have. I think you broke uh, some records been, with that. It's been a blessing for me, but but I just wanted to prove that I could do more because I've always been a running back. You know, I, I like getting the handoff and going and, yeah. um, you know, being able to run routes and, and catch the ball is obviously a huge plus and it's, it's been my best friend. Um, but – I think being able to run the ball is something that I, you know, I, I love to do, you know, it's like when a running quarterback is called a running quarterback. No one wants to be called a run. You know, you want to be, yeah. you want to be a quarterback who can run. Absolutely. But you know, I, I just, I wanted to, I wanted to play in the NFL, play running back in the NFL and um, you know, be a three down back. And, and I knew that I had to do that if I, if I wanted to go. What, um, when you were at Stanford and you correct me if, I, if I'm wrong, but, freshman year you did okay right but was it sophomore year was really your breakout year yeah sophomore year what was the year i was up up for okay. that yeah my bad yeah i mean just i mean that's a pretty damn good year what uh what do you feel like what was the difference between your your freshman year and your sophomore year that really you know catapulted you to a completely different player um it was my it was my first time in the off season uh being able to to you know, really train. I had never trained for a football season in my life up until then. You know, I, I played three sports all through my senior year in high school. And so, you know, That's I got crazy. I didn't, re I didn't I, realize you did it all through high school, like in the high school, you were playing all three sports. Yeah. Yeah. You know, wow. I, I ran track my, my senior year and, um, you know, so I, so I got to, you know, be in a college strength program and work with a coach and lift weights and, you know, do all the conditioning and speed work. And so, I grew a little bit um, and I played more, <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I got a lot more playing time, which was a big help. And, uh, you know, everything almost came together. We actually lost our first game that year. My first game as a starter, we, we lost to Northwestern. Um, and, and I didn't know how the year was going to go. And I remember, you know, I was so lucky to have so many good teammates, but our quarterback, Kevin Hogan, I'll never forget. He, you know, he pulled me aside when we landed and, and, you know, he was like, we're going to need you. You know, we're going to need you this year. Keep your head up. And I remember he just said a lot of encouraging things to me that I'll, that I'll never forget. And uh, to me, it was, it, was, it was special that someone like that who had been a three-year starter, who had won a Rose Bowl, you know, came up to me and said that. And then from there, you know, we kind of we, – we didn't lose. We didn't lose. We ended up losing one more game, but we won the Rose Bowl that year and won the Pac-12 championship. And, um, you know, I think – football is such a team game. And, you know, while, while a lot of the individual success gets talked about, it's, it really is a team game. You know, you need 11 guys to do their job in order to have that, that individual success. And you share that, you know, those touchdowns are shared, you know, you can't score without a hole. You can't catch the ball without a QB throwing it to you. QB can't throw it to you without good pro. So um, I love that that year's team was one of the most special teams that I've ever played with. You know, we had so many great vets guy, you know, we had, talented team a bunch of guys are in the league now uh and having success in the league too um but but we played together we played for each other we had fun and uh when all that happens and you know you're, you're getting the ball a bunch and your o-line's great and all that stuff it, it just becomes a fun game i love it what uh 
so, so you end up, you know, crushing it, obviously, in college. You become one of the greatest running backs of all time. You break the all-purpose yard record Barry San- uh, that Barry Sanders held. Who, and Barry Sanders' son happened to be on your team, which is kind of crazy little interesting point. Was it what, – what did he say with that? Was that a little weird or – uh, it was cool. You know, I actually never to this day met him. Uh, I never met oh. Barry, but um, no, it was cool. I mean, you know, I used to have posters of him on my wall and stuff. And so that was, that was, he was a beast. Um, you know, that was a, it was a cool accomplishment. I don't even know. I don't think I appreciated it enough when, you know, when I was there, um, but it definitely was a cool accomplishment. So we go on to the pros and um, rookie season. It was decent. Would you say like, I mean, yeah, you didn't. You weren't breaking records in the NFL, right? Right. No, I think my rookie year was actually very similar to my freshman year in Stanford. Uh, when I compare both of those, yeah, uh, I had come in and and there was already a running back there. Uh, same as my my rookie year. You know, they kind of had a lot of older running backs who had played, and I think they used that year kind of to to develop me and and get me going. Um, so my rookie year in the league, you know, Jonathan Stewart was he's the you know, Panthers' all time leading rusher and a hell of a player. And so I got an opportunity to learn from him for a year, you know, and really, really see what he did. And I was used and I think I had, you know, I don't know how many touchdowns I had, but I, I had a good year. I wouldn't say it was a great year. It was good. It was a decent, you know, I was a, I was a player on the team, but I, I don't think I was, you know, and, and realistically, I, like I said, the, the jumps that I made from my freshman year to my sophomore year were, were incredible um, physically. And I think, you know, I was young, I was 20 years old, you know what I mean? Getting, I got drafted at 20 and I've always been a younger guy for my grade but um you know i remember asking coach rivera i know that because you got the same birthday as my son by the way when i was looking oh, yeah. at him, i'm like look at that right, good. My, i hope my son grows up to be like christian mccaffrey let's go <laughs> <laughs> gemini you don't want that uh, <laughs> no but uh you know i uh i remember i asked coach rivera after the season you know i was you know i knew Stu was leaving and I was like, you know, what do, what do I got to do to be the starter? You know, I want, I want to start for this football team. I want to be the guy. And he said, you know, we want you to increase your, your leg strength and break more arm tackles. And I was, I was so appreciative that he told me, I was like, perfect, you know, done. Like, you know, I'm, I'm ready to go to work. And so all off season, I, I worked on my strength, my power, my explosion, and got, I got a little bit bigger, a little stronger and definitely faster. And then our OC got fired. I've had so much carryover since I've been in the league. The amount of change is ridiculous, but our OC got fired and um, North Turner, who, who had coached LT, Emmett Smith, you know, some of the guys that you know, I've seen every single one of their highlights. So I was fired up and I was just excited to learn from him. And uh, from the jump, I felt like, you know, he was always he was hard on me from the jump in the best way, though. And uh, but I could tell he believed in me and that meant a lot. You know what I mean? He believed in, in the way I ran routes and, and, you know, the fact that I could catch the ball and. Uh, and run between the tackles and it's it's something that's rare um, you know to to have a coach believe in you when when really you know not a lot of other people did even regardless of what you've accomplished so I'm, I'm extremely thankful for him uh, really changed my career in a lot of different ways um, and got to work with him for the for the next two years and just continue to grow and get better so he was he was perfect for what you're good at right right be able to catch the ball because you said he coached Ladanian Thomas Tomlinson. Yeah, he, he coached LT. He coached Emmett Smith. He coached Sproles. Um, you know, and, and he he's won games. Um, so, you know, I knew I knew he had seen the best, and you know, and I was excited to kind of prove him, you know, prove to him, or, or at least you know try to show him and pick his brain on you know I want to be like that. I want to be like those guys that you coach. You know, what do I got to do? And um, learning from him was great. Awesome. Um, as far as strength training, you said, you know, you got bigger, stronger and everything. Uh, what were we doing strength wise that you feel like gave you that jump? Was it just more time or it was actual yeah, different techniques? Naturally, you know, you get older, you grow, you get stronger as you, as you get older. Um, absolutely. And then, uh, and then it starts going the other way, by the way, oh, not that I'm there yet, but like at some point, <laughs> no, <laughs> just kidding. Um, yeah, you know, I, I, uh, I did a lot of different things. You know, I, I did a lot of different Olympic lifts, you know, really worked on that, that initial burst. I started working with a track coach who, you know, was fine tuning all the different angles of where to, you know, foot placement of power of, you know, becoming an athlete who plays football. And, and, um, I think that was the biggest thing for me that I learned throughout all the, all the people that I've worked with is you, you have to maintain a level of athleticism. You can't be stiff. 
you know? So I was doing stuff in the pool, you know, the rock wall, doing different gymnastics exercises. You know, then I was doing my runs, my linear stuff, then the lifts um, were, you know, Olympic lifts, power lifts, you know, a lot of um, low reps, heavy weight as I got closer to the season. You know, when you're farther out, you don't have to you know, lift as heavy and do all that stuff. But, um, you know, it, it was really about explosion and, and that that first step. And, you know, going back to what Coach Rivera told me, uh, power and breaking arm tackle. So I knew you had, you know, you got to be strong. I don't care what anybody says. You got to be strong to play running back in, in, in this league. Um, you know, you just have to, you got to have a good base. You got to have, you know, some sort of explosion to you uh, in order to do that stuff. Um, were you always going back home to Denver during off season to do the strength and conditioning? Yeah. Yeah. I was in Denver, which was awesome for the altitude. And I'd bounced around every once in a while, but mostly Denver. Gotcha. What, um, uh, what, what, what like strength and conditioning stuff, that you that like what how many days let me ask you this how many days a week do you do uh strength and conditioning in the off season versus in in season uh you know, it depends i think this year i'll change you know as you get older you it's not that you do less but you just have to taper a little bit in certain areas and just be more cognitive of of where you're at um and and it also like you know we have a long off season our off season you know obviously we didn't we're not making the playoffs so it starts um really, you know, now like January 10th or, or I think. So, you know, you don't, you don't start camp till, till July or uh, yeah, July 25th. So you, you got a long chunk of time and, and you don't want to burn out and you don't want to peak before you're supposed to. And so the, the struggle is how much do you do now? Cause I, I struggle just not doing anything. I've always feel like I have to do something, you know what I mean? Whether it's, you know, get on the, you know, verse, I don't know, anything, right? Like I, I try to do something. Um, but now it's figuring out what can I do to, to keep my nervous system firing, maintain that, that quick twitch and not mess up my joints. And so um, later in the year, you know, as I'm training for camp, I'll, I'll go Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And that Monday is really the day of, you know, you're, you're really, you know, you're a Formula One car, you're going, you know, it's mm -hmm. fast, explosive, maximum rest, but every single rep is, is a uh, massive neural output. And the Wednesday is, a, is change of direction. And the lift kind of matches the run, if that makes sense. The Wednesday is more change of direction, football stuff, but you're still excelling, but it's more lateral accelerations, running back drills. And then same thing, the, the lift will match the run. And then Friday is, you know, you're, you're gassed by Friday. So, you yeah. know, you can't, you're not going to be breaking any 60 meter records on Friday. So it's, uh, it's more of you treat it like a conditioning kind of fun day, you know, go out there, run routes with the boys um, you know, kind of some meathead stuff in the gym, you know, shoot hoops, whatever it might be, you know what I mean? But just do something just to finish the week off strong. It also depends on, you know, your energy levels. If I'm, if I'm shot or I'm gassed, you know, we'll do less. And if I'm ready to roll, we're, we'll push it to as far as, you know, until, until we're ready to roll. So. And is uh Tuesday, Thursday, is that completely days off doing nothing or what are you? No, so Tuesday, that? Thursday is the, um, that's the days where I do more, uh, primal movements, gymnastic stuff, sauna, Eldoa, different drills in the pool, um, active recovery, I'd call it. Let's talk about the Eldoa because I, I know you're pretty fanatical about this, right? Um, can you explain this? I've done it a little bit, but I don't, <clears throat> I've done it literally like before some workouts, you know, just some of the stretches to lengthen the spine. Um, but I hear you you take this thing to a whole nother level. He explain that to everybody who doesn't know and then kind of teach me to. It's fascial stretching. So it's, you're stretching the tissue around the muscles, not the muscle, in the angles that, you know, they're going to perform in. And so, uh, you know, for me, it's – I like doing it at night after the sauna, but it's not – it's it's like a, it's a workout in and of itself. So it's hard to just go in cold and do it efficiently. You know, you have to be prepped. Like the, if you were going to do it perfectly – you would, you know, you'd eat two hours before you'd make sure you're hydrated and you've digested your food. And then you hop in the sauna for, you know, 10 minutes just to get warm, warm up the, the tissue. And then you would do it. And then you'd hop back in the sauna, you know, hydrate all that stuff and then get like another meal and go to bed. That's the best way to do it. But it's, are you, it's, are you doing traditional? Um, I got to cut you off real fast. Are you doing traditional sauna or infrared sauna? Traditional. 
So as hot as possible? Hot as it can be. Yeah. Yeah. How hot do you get? How hot can you get yours up? I, I rigged mine to get to like 215. I got, I, I got to, we'll, we'll text back and forth. I, my, my, I just apparently used my sauna too much and overdid it. And my, it like burned out the wires. And really? so I'm, I'm having them send me something, you know, to fix it now, but huh. I got to figure out the best thing, the best uh, thing to do with that, to, to rig it because mine was, it's just not getting as high as I wanted to get. Yeah. That's frustrating. Yeah. It's annoying, but wait, I, I'm sorry. Go with the, go back to the other stuff. Yeah. So it's, it's really your, it's, it's hard to explain without, you know, a, a guy. So you, I've, what I've learned about it is you need a professional who really knows what he's doing. So I work with a guy in, in New York, Ben Velasquez, who, you know. Oh, guides, I've worked with Ben before in yeah. New York City. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so he guides me through it, you know, over a FaceTime call. But I also learned, you know, it's, it's, if you're stiff and you're locked up, it's really hard to do the movement. So I, you know, it's, I think it's important you get treatment and you're adjusted and you're ready and then do it. You know, it's, it's, it's very uh, specific and it's easy to mess up if you're doing it on your own because there's so many cues that you have to go through in order to do it correctly. It's frustrating too. It can be, it's really hard. So it, it can be really frustrating. Um, but, you know, I approach it like, okay, this is a workout. This isn't just, you know, let me go stretch. Like it's going to be its own, its own deal. So how much time uh, does it take like a typical session? I do 30 minutes. I don't go more than that. Um, 30 minutes. I get okay. gassed if I, if I go more than that. So I, and I, you're not doing this like pregame or anything like that? This is- I, don't, I don't do it pregame. I do it, I do it to finish the night. So after gotcha. everything. I like having a little bit of stiffness, you know, in the, in the joints come in the tissue on a, on a performance day and then unload it. You know, it's all about you load and then you unload, right? It's you load the body with training and lifting and doing all that stuff. And then at the end of the day, you unload you know, so you, you take all that stiffness from the, from the tissue and the muscles and the joints, and then you unload it to create more space, create more flow. Are you doing this like five days a week or? No, I do it in the off season. I, I'll do it more in these next two months. I'll, I'll do it four or five times a week, just because it's, I'm going to be doing less of the training. Um, but in season, I do it uh, probably three, three times a week. All right. Are you a uh, morning routine guy? Yeah, or more night owl. I'm a morning guy. Morning guy. What what uh what morning routines you got? You know what, man? I've learned uh, for me the best thing that's helped me over the years is I like to feed the brain in the morning, and 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 you know whether it's listening to a podcast or you know listening to some sort of motivational speech or read a book. And I love coffee. I look forward to coffee every morning. Oh, well, me too. I'm a big coffee um, guy. Freshly yeah, grinded bo- those beans every morning. French press. I'm a French. Oh, you oh I don't like French press. press. You got your own uh, grinder? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Grind the beans. Oh, sick. You don't have your own grinder, bro? I mean, I got like a coffee machine. Yeah. That, that like grinds the beans, but I, I don't know that like, you personally grind. Oh, them. yeah. I personally grind the beans to the, that the, common, the coarseness. That's not a common thing, is it? I feel like, come on, you're not a true coffee snob. You're an amateur. Well, if you're not grinding I, your old I, beans. I, I'm not a, I wouldn't call myself a snob. But I don't I, like calling myself a snob either, but I have to. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you got to be a, you got to be a grinder, bro. I'll send you some pictures of what you need to get. I, I need, you need a legit coffee station over there in the huh? McCaffrey household. You need a legit coffee station. I well, I thought I had one. Apparently, I don't. I, I don't you know. Your coffee station sucks now. It's all, all, you know, hoopty. I guess it's not, though. Yeah, my brother-in-law was into the the French press, and I got him off of it recently. I guess for one cup of coffee, the French press is good. I don't know, but You're more than one. I'm not a fan of I'm not a fan of French Are press. You more than one a day? Uh two, probably two a day. But in around it, only usually in the morning. I don't yeah, maybe I if anything want- like I'm drinking tea right now. I'll do tea in the oh. afternoon if I want to feel even more snobby. But <laughs> uh, that's that's about it. I've been going one, one coffee with an espresso in the coffee just to make it a little, give it a little more kick. Is that like a Keurig uh, espresso? Uh, no, I, I have an espresso. Um, I got a nice coffee maker at my house that does espresso. It just grinds the beans for longer. And, and, uh, but they're not espresso beans. You know, the, the best espresso, they have their own bean and it's yeah. you know, the really nice ones, but I don't have that. The way to do an espresso the right way is on the stove with like, a, I think it's called a Bellotti. It's this huh. Italian little thing that you, yeah. And you put like the fresh espresso inside this 
little I'm not going to explain it good you get enough. The creme at the bottom of it. Yeah, of course. You need the creme, you know. Uh, you know, I went to Italy a few times. I learned I learned the right way to make espresso. I don't but I don't do espresso a lot because it takes more time and yeah. I like making a pot of coffee. Yeah, yeah. I got a wife and kids though, so you know I got to wake up and make a coffee. That's right. Do that whole that, that whole thing, but man, I appreciate you doing this. This was great. Yeah, no problem, man. Appreciate you having me on. Like I said, man, huge fan. Always rooting for you. And uh, yeah, thanks for having me on. Thanks for watching today's episode. If you enjoyed it, please let us know in the comments below. Won't back down is also available as a podcast. So feel free to give us a follow wherever you get your podcasts.